flying horses, steam elephants, what? Steam engines? When people first saw these contraptions, they thought they were dangerous, untamed animals. They thought that horses would stampede and the milk would go sour. At the beginning of the 19th century, steam engines were on the move, but they were unreliable, dangerous, and smashed the rails they ran on. Steam was out of control. So who tamed these spitting wild beasts? George Stevenson is remembered as the father of the railways. After all, his son Robert designed Rocket, the most famous steam locomotive ever built. But what most people don't know is that Rocket came along 28 years after the invention of the first drivable steam engine. It was in 1801 that the genius Cornish steam engineer Richard Trevithick made the quantum leap from this a massive engine used to haul ore out of mines to this, the world's first self-propelled engine is road locomotive. And just two years later, Trevithick was experimenting with steam engines on rails. Look at this, a replica of the world's first railway loco, Richard Trevithick's portable engine of 1803. It's a very versatile machine, it's a great big flywheel, so it's also usable as a stationary engine. But it moves, it runs on rails. And there's the problem. The cast iron rails are too brittle for this heavy engine. They broke. And Trevithick's high pressure steam experiment foundered. But the problem was being addressed. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, and a great cloud, and a fire. The collieries of the northeast where George Stevenson started his career had long been avid users of technology. By the beginning of the 19th century, they were exporting 2.7 million tonnes of coal from the Tyne and the Weir. Big business. The viewers of the collieries, a combination of Chief Executive Officer and Research and Development Supremo, had funded and encouraged research into new branches of science. Metallurgy, explosives, geology, and steam. Coal mines were using steam engines to bring men and coal to the surface. The pits were the place to become a steam engineer. George Stevenson joined his father down the pits and by 1801, at the age of 20, his mechanical ability endured him the most responsible job in the pit, the engine man. The man who controlled the movement of the cages up and down the shaft. Not allowed to leave his post all day. The engine man's chair was a commode. Stevenson wound thousands of tonnes of coal to the surface with this high-tech winding machine. But once in the daylight, it was back to muscle power. Horses slowly hauled coal wagons that ran on wooden rails. The area was crisscrossed with wagonways. They'd been there for 100 years, carrying coal from the collieries down to the rivers to be shipped by sea to London. It seemed obvious to engineers at the time that steam should be used in place of horse. But taming steam power wasn't going to be easy. Trevithick's experimental rail locomotives had exposed major problems. Frustratingly, the weight of the engine broke the fragile cast iron rails, but lighter engines just didn't have the grip. It led to some strange compromises. At the Middleton Colliery, John Blenkinsop and Matthew Murray produced this, not this, this is the model. Um, it's their attempt to deal with the problems of traction and they're using a cogged wheel here that connects with a toothed rail. So that would mean you've got better traction rather than just friction from the wheels and it would also translate more power from the engine so you could get 
more usable power from a lighter engine. However, it's only on one side, so you'd have a constant flexing motion, and also it's very expensive, and how could you guarantee with the engineering tolerances of the time that you'd constantly get the mesh? William Chapman and John Buddle, the team behind this locomotive, tackled the traction and adhesion problems in a different way. Adhesion, wheels, no rack, no pinion, uh, but the piston rods don't connect with the wheels, they connect with gears. It's a gear drive. See that cog wheel there on the axle. The theory being that the load was spread over three axles and made it less stressful on the track. Although Chapman and Buddle's solution was ingenious, it wasn't a very efficient way of moving a heavy engine. Constantly learning from the mistakes of others, pit engineers were running in a technological race, and the prize would be the world's first usable steam railway. By 1815, trials of locomotives were taking place at many collieries. Wylam, Heaton, Newbottle, Killingworth, Wall's End, there was surprisingly little secrecy. It was all taking place within a radius of about 15 miles, so the engineers were swapping ideas. With so many people building engines in such a small area, Stevenson was able to take the best ideas around to create engines of his own. One loco particularly impressed him. The famous Puffing Billy was hauling coal wagons on a tramway past the house where he was born. And when George was asked to build locos for the Killingworth Colliery, the owners wanted engines as good as this. By 1814, he was making some real progress. George Stevenson had made two locomotives, My Lord and Blucher, both very successful. They halved the cost of carrying coal where they were used and gained him a reputation as the foremost of that generation's locomotive engineers. Blucher was the first loco to use flanged wheels, like these. It had a gauge of four foot eight and a half inches. That was the gauge of the wagonways in the local area and Stevenson thought no more about it. However, that later became the worldwide standard gauge. For the next six years, Stevenson's colliery locomotives earned him a fine reputation as an engineer. But like all colliery engines, they were still only running short distances. Then, in 1821, steam engines were given a chance to break free. George Stevenson was about to earn a very special place in history. The people of the towns of Stockton and Darlington wanted a better way of transporting their coal to the Tees so it could be shipped around Britain on boat. They were led by local industrialist Mr Edward Pease and in 1821 he met Stevenson and became convinced that what they needed was a railway worked by steam locomotives. George and his son Robert were in the right place at the right time. Edward Pease was so enthusiastic about George's locos that he financed the Stevensons to establish the world's first specialist locomotive works, Robert Stevenson and Company. But before they could set up their bespoke locomotive works, there was a major problem to be solved. By 1821, steam engines had been able to move under their own power for 20 years. But Trevithick's original problem of brittle cast iron rails breaking under the weight of heavy locomotives hadn't gone away. For the opening of the Stockton and Darlington Railway, George Stevenson tried something new. He told the committee of the Stockton and Darlington Railway that they would have to use wrought iron rails. Wrought iron is worked, rolled or hammered. It's wrought. It gives it tensile strength. Wrought iron can bend. Cast iron breaks. The pig's taken on the boat. 
Frankie to the rollers where it's passed continuously from one man to another. Each time the pig goes through the wet rollers, it decreases in size. The rollers get smaller and smaller. Every time it goes through, it's worked. The crystalline structure is extended. It stops being a honeycomb and becomes layers like puff pastry, giving it much more tensile strength. Wrought iron made for much stronger, lighter rails. And they could be butted together, joined on site to create a much smoother ride. Come in. With his fancy new wrought iron rails, George was in business. But it was still nearly four years before the 32 mile long line was completed. To support the track, 100,000 stone blocks had to be laid. It was a fantastic achievement, and to top it off, George produced his greatest engine yet, the locomotion number one. So, the great day arrived, September the 27th, 1825. Locomotion was bought by cart from Newcastle and manhandled onto the tracks by navvies. The Stockton and Darlington Railway was opened and 40 to 50,000 people lined the tracks. George Stevenson, took control of the locomotive. In the Durham County Advertiser, an article read, Astonishment was not confined to the human species, for the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air seemed to view with wonder the awe of the machine, which now moved onward at a rate of 10 nor 12 miles per hour, with a weight of not less than 80 tonnes attached to it. The Stockton and Darlington Railway proved a big success. It was the first public railway that covered a long distance, but it was built to carry freight. After its inaugural run, passengers were less excitingly pulled in horse wagons. However, George's next railway building adventure was going to change that and the future of rail transport forever. And like many of his contemporaries, George Stevenson was a semi-literate, self-made man. But that was no reflection on his engineering ability or his ambition. And his next project was huge. An intercity line, the first between Liverpool and Manchester. The timing was perfect. The cotton industry in Manchester was booming, but they needed a fast link to the port of Liverpool. That was where raw cotton came in and finished goods went out. But building a railway to carry freight and passengers pitted Stevenson against two powerful enemies. The canal lobbyists were worried about losing their monopoly on freight and the road lobby feared that stagecoaches would give way to railway coaches. Parliament needed to approve the bill to build the line and George's rushed first survey played straight into the hands of the lobbyists. But Stevenson had made some fundamental errors. His bridge over the River Irwell was to have arches only 10 feet above the water, barely navigable at high tide. The counsel for the canal companies, Mr Alderson, was merciless in his summing up. Mr Stevenson speaks of an arch at Lawton that is to cost £375. How high is it to be? He does not know. At what rate per yard is it to be? He has not formed an opinion. He is either ignorant or something else I would not care to mention. But George was the most famous railway engineer of his day and wasn't about to be defeated by the so-called London experts that he mistrusted so much. The second survey was made and the line was built and from it lines rapidly spread to Birmingham and onwards to London. This is one of the engineering triumphs of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, the Sankey Viaduct near Liverpool. The Sankey Brook navigation and its clever London lawyers are long gone. George had proved himself in beating Parliament and the canal lobbyists. He built the line from Liverpool to Manchester, but now he had to prove himself all over again by providing a locomotive that could work on his line. In 1829, three locos, 
Novelty, Sans Parai and Rocket were put through a series of trials at Rainhill near Liverpool to find the fastest, most reliable engine for the job. The prize was £500 and the chance to run the world's first passenger railway. And this is the winner, or rather a replica of the winner. Rocket, probably the most famous locomotive ever. And it's easy to see why. This locomotive finally banished the idea that you needed horses to run railways. This is the first passenger locomotive, a free running locomotive. You don't have to keep tinkering with it. You don't have to operate it. You can drive it. Look at the speed we're going. George had this engine going at 35 miles per hour when he was accompanied on the footplate by the beautiful actress Fanny Kemble. This is exciting. No wonder people got worked up about Rocket. It's a loco. It's a proper steam engine. So why did Rocket win? What were the technological advantages over Sans Parai, which was a colliery engine, and Novelty, which was a vertical boiled novelty? Direct coupling between the piston and the driving wheel. Pistons set at an angle to reduce the hammer effect of vertical pistons. A blast pipe, the exhaust from the piston, is sent to the bottom of the chimney, creating a vacuum, drawing air through the fire, much more thermically efficient. And this is what makes engines go chuff. Most importantly, a multi-tubed boiler. Instead of the fire just heating the bottom of the water like a big kettle, there are lots of tubes. The water surrounds these tubes, the hot gases from the fire pass through the tubes and heat the water that way. They are in the water. It is more thermodynamically efficient. There are more hot bits in the water. Apparently, because it's painted yellow, it attracts wasps. And it's a bit tricky in the summer, trying to drive it. George had trusted his son Robert with the task of designing an engine that proved to be way ahead of its time. And the technological advances that he made on Rocket were soon followed up in the next year on his newer engine. Rocket was built to win a competition. This locomotive planet is one of a long line of Stevenson Company locomotives built to run railways. Completed only one year after the Rainhill Trials in 1830, this locomotive incorporates all the Stevenson Company current thinking on how a passenger locomotive should look, how it should work and how it should be operated. For a start, this was the first locomotive with a proper area for the fireman and the driver, a proper footplate. And they were protected by these rather lovely railings here. Right away, please, Stuart. I've always wanted to do that. The Stevensons were so confident at this point that this aesthetic of the engine was becoming very important. And some of the rules that they laid down became the norm for over 50 years. And this engine actually set some of the standards of what a locomotive should look like. It is a very elegant piece of engineering indeed. And Brunel, who ordered two locomotives from the Stevenson Company, was so pleased with the first that he declared that it would be an ornament in any drawing room. Stirring times. You can sense the excitement and confidence of the engineers by the naming of their locos. Arrow, Dart, Phoenix, Mercury, Samson, Goliath and Venus. With growing confidence and more and more engineers working in the steam business, locomotive designs change fast. 
Even though it was only a year after Rocket won the Rainhill Trials, this engine was yet another giant leap in steam technology. On planet, the cylinders are mounted inside the frame of the engine. You can't see them. On Rocket, they were outside at an angle. On planet, they're inside and horizontal. This gave the engine a much smoother delivery of power to the wheels. And by building the locomotive around a frame, instead of bolting everything to the boiler, the Stevensons had much more freedom to arrange their engine exactly as they wanted. Furthermore, this frame is what's called a sandwich construction. Metal either side and wood in the middle. Flexibility, strength, that was the way it was for the next 50 years. An abundance of brass and the boiler, very tastefully clad in mahogany. A handsome piece of engineering. Such was the confidence of the Stevensons at this point that they felt they could dictate the style of locomotives. George Stevenson had taken dangerous experimental steam locomotives from the pits of northeast England and created a company that built off the peg engines that it exported to the world. Thanks to him, the little colliery lines had evolved into public railways with grand civil engineering worked by steam engines. The future of rail transport was assured. But only 25 years after the opening of the Stockton and Darlington Railway, the beasts had been tamed and railways were powering people across every continent in the world. Come on, Charlie. Yeah, I'll give us a go. You do it. <laughs>